wonderful to be here. Hi, everyone. I'm Adi. I'm uh, working for Microsoft as a cloud advocate, uh, working with the community. Uh, my expertise is around distributed systems, machine learning, and big data. And this is Sven. Oh, can you hear me? Yes. So I just tried it. So my name is Sven. Um, yes, I'm developer advocate for Vardin. Who knows Vardin? It's a reindeer. Right. <laughs> no. We are creating web frameworks, so buttons, grids, and all this stuff. So um, I'm coding Java since 1996, so since I'm working in industrial environments and earning my money with Java, working in the field of distributed systems since a longer time, and was active as a consultant worldwide. And then I joined this UI company 2017. Why? Because I'm mostly on a server side, and this is what we need today. So. Um, yeah, this is um, not Jägermeister Winter Edition. This is the logo from Vardin. Oh, this recorded, huh? Oh, okay. <laughs> Cut this off. Okay, and Oracle themes that I'm able to spell Java in the right way. So this is just what we are going through. Okay, we have split it up, this talk, a little bit in two parts. Because I'm the old one, the dinosaur, and I'm talking about the legacy stuff. And she is talking about the fancy new stuff, infrastructure, cloud, and, and the future. Yeah, exactly, the future. So, um, yeah, we will split it up. And so I will start with where we are coming from, and then we will go where we want to go through. Good luck. Okay. So, everything I'm saying is influenced by a few points. Who's working on a code base that's not older than six months? One year? Five years, 10 years, automotive, space, defense, yeah. So mostly, if you're dealing with this stuff, I was working in this um, kind of project, you have certain things. Um, huge amount of lines of code, an old team that's working quite long at this code base, a bunch of consultants jumping in, jumping out. And now we have a look at this Swing app. Who knows what Swing is? Not this dancing thing. Swing app from Java. So, and then you have this big, big, big desktops apps. And slowly they want to migrate. They have a few questions. Huh? So why you want to migrate? How to migrate? What's the timeline of this? Who's supporting this migration project already? Nobody? Nobody migrated from desktop to web once? It's fun. OK, so the main thing is you have something like this. This desktop is a monolith, and then you're going to something, only to have a few buzzwords. It's serverless, microservice, whatever. So something that's running not on your client is some, somewhere. Somewhere, what she will explain. But the main thing is, here everything was easy. You have everything on your laptop, and you can code, debug, and all this stuff, and then you have a developer environment with all this stuff around. Can you do everything in your, on your own laptop and how to split up this stuff? But mostly, if you start coding in a legacy project, I have a certain feeling, exactly this one. So, this is mostly the kickoff. And then there is a strategic thing we want to reach, and we want to go to something like this. So the main thing is, if you have this Swing app, it's a Java-based app, and you have an old team. An old team means it has domain knowledge and knows how to code, um, all stakeholders are in place, all this stuff. And then the strategic decision is we are going to web. And then you have one thing they really like. They know, OK, my UI is somewhere. And then you have to s talk to the server-side thing. And it would be great if you have pure Java on both sides of the API. Yeah, you can go over REST, but this is mostly one thing the developers coming from a core JDK development cycle really like. It means that you have something like the UI is talking against something, going over JSON to something in the cloud, and you have some, some modules now. From one module, you have now different modules. What does it mean for, for your environment? What does it mean for the technology stack? Mostly if you have this, you start a discussion, and it ends up in a discussion like this. You have this desktop, core Java, everybody's happy, and then they will introduce all this stuff here. Who knows what this is? Huh? 
And then at the same time, they are talking about a new team. They want to build up a new team. What happened in your project, migration project? Nobody wants to support it. Who wants to support something that will retire yourself? So the main thing is, the big lag here is it's not the same. So how to hold this old team and stuff. The main thing, what is coming after this, is a discuss discussion about what's a web dev stack. And it looks like this one. So this is a feeling if you're dealing with different JavaScript libraries and tooling and CSS and all this stuff. And the old people from the UI development with Swing sitting down there and try to navigate. Great, because the old one, mostly the project leads. So um, yeah, there's, there's a lack of different things. The main thing here is um, the team itself for this transition we need. I don't want to go too much in detail, but you have some certain things having in mind and then you will see, okay, the technology is part of it. So do we have a senior developer? A senior developer is not always bad if he's old because you have this young people trying to achieve something and working and then you have your old senior guy. Perfect, you like it. So don't get rid of them, hold them, it's important. But if you're dealing with people that are a little bit older, you have to start learning again. You have a new tech stack, this cloud thing and all this stuff, and you have to focus on new paradigms and fancy right now is functional instead of object-oriented or reactive is, everybody is talking about reactive. Huh? Observer pattern, if you have it longer time. Or adding new languages if you're switching to the uh, web stuff. But not everybody want to learn. And that means you have, or say it a little bit more polite, some people are learning faster. Okay, maybe you can help me how to say it in the UK proper, but this is the only thing I could think. So this leads to some reactions and you have to deal with this in your team during the transition. The first one is you have this behavior of running away. Some people are just disappearing. The next thing is you have this type of developer that always expecting something. It's nice and shiny, but there must be some poisoning stuff somewhere. And well, some people saying, I'm just feeling too old. This new web stuff don't come to me, please. So how to deal with this? Because you don't want to lose them. You have to deal with this uh, stuff and you have to make them happy again, something like this, so that they are fancy and uh, colored again. So how to solve this? This is a challenge inside your team, inside your company, how to do this is a more social aspect, but you have to motivate your team. Motivate your team is, okay, what can we do to, to start with this tran um, transition? Um, there's one thing, if you're only in this Java stack, we have this new release cycle from Oracle. Who knows this? Who played with this new release cycle already? A few JDK transitions. It's fun, tried it. And then the landscape just changed. We have different vendors now with different versions and they are not always the same, so from this language level and uh, stuff. But if you're going to cloud, you have to deal with this. So this cloud provider is using Azul, the next one is using OpenJDK, the next one is whatever. So, and you have a timeline. Desktop to web means you have different phases you're going through. And mostly companies deciding, okay, we have these different phases going to web and server side, and then we are switching maybe only to long-term support versions of the JDK. This is painful. Mostly it ends up something like this. It's a little bit more fine-grained. You have different versions every six months and then it's just here to uh, support this and how to make this transition. Okay. This example I'm showing here is on GitHub. I organize it in a way that you have three modules there. One is a core swing app. You can just open this Maven uh, POM file and then you have the core swing app and this is a start. With this, you can try to transform this one by yourself. Then I have a core web application from scratch, uh, coded with Vardin. I will show why this is a good choice for a Java developer. And then I have this hybrid project. This is really, there's a backend service, there's some Docker files, you can ramp up the UI differently and all this stuff. It's one possible solution, only one possible solution, okay? So you can play around with this stuff here by yourself. The Swing app. I want to show, normally you have to, well, escape, escape, 
Escape, escape, escape. So now I have to switch that we are syncing those monitors, otherwise it's just pain. So uh, the main thing is what is uh, where we have it. So I just forget to start this stuff. The main thing is how this is coded. So if you have a UI, mostly it ends up that you have this action listener stuff and inside this action listener stuff, you have mostly a bunch of logic. And then over the years, the swing app is just growing, 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 and then you have quite a mess. The main thing is how it looks normally. Well, this is a core swing thing here. And you have somewhere for example, so can you see this? It's a main application. You have something like an event bus if you're good. Other um, design pattern is mostly used in Swing that you're doing everything inside your constructor. Well, you have this initializing block inside you're creating the whole UI, all action listeners, all this stuff. And this is totally bound. So it means that if you're doing everything inside your constructor to get rid of this stuff, and to extend this life cycle a little, a little bit more is, is just work. But you can prepare your stuff here with, uh, with this. And what I want to show here is that if you have this app just running, for example, you have to deal with different life cycles. For example, one life cycle is, I have to start maybe the, the service. No. This is, I think, okay. So one thing is that uh, desktop apps have its own life cycle. You have maybe this login screen, then you say login, yes, no. And um, by the way, admin, admin, it's just high security here. So after this login, mostly they ended up with some notification. And after this notification, if it is useful or not, you have the screen. What we have is mostly in this desktop app, this huge crud thing. And what's mostly here is some kind of logic. With some kind of logic, I mean, this is just blocked. And if you want to have something, you have this pop-up, you're selecting something, it's loaded, and then you can access your UI. So it's nothing fancy. The only thing what I wanted to show here is that you have to transform this behavior to a web app. You have different strategies. You can do everything from scratch, then you're changing too many things. But you can try to do exactly the same as a web app then you are only transforming technology from one to the other one. You can learn about the new stack, you can dockerize all this stuff, and then you can start optimizing the user experience. So you have something completely different. So this is more or less what you have here, and what you can see, you have here, for example, exactly the same, um, how to build the menu bar and all this stuff. It's just plain swing. What I want to show here is the UI itself. And if you're uh, switching to the um, piece of code from, from the Vardin stack, by Vardin, Vardin will give you the possibility to deal with um, components Vardin, in a way a Java developer just know. It means, uh, no, not Vardin, Heroku, Vardin.com. So I hope this is fast enough. So the main thing is here. You're creating exactly the same behavior. You're on the server side, you're not on the client side. And if you want to have this one, you have the possibility to, to write code in the same way. For example, if you want to have a text field, you write new text field. It's nearly the same like you would code it in Swing. The good thing is we have projects that we just completely automated migrated Swing apps to Vardin apps. It's a server side thing. You can analyze this stuff and then you can transform most of the source code, and then you have a web app, and it looks nearly the same. If you want to see how this is looking, I gave you this um, example, this Vardin app, and here I have done exactly the same stuff. So, for example, if you're looking at this Vardin app, it is here, for example, you want to have some tabs, then you say, I have new tabs. That's it. You say in the same way orientation is vertical or horizontal and all this stuff. You have to deal with IATN. So it means you can code this stuff in the same way, like you have done in Swing. And maybe I will, should work for the app, where it is. So, I don't know where. Ah, here. 
so and if you run this one I only want to show that you can transform this behavior more or less in the same way so, so what you can see is there are different startup times and this startup time I have done here uh, this npm stuff okay let's see if I killed my own thing localhost 80 80 90 90 no I killed it perfect I'll ramp it up in docker in a second with my second example this is if you're playing too long at this stuff so okay what I want to show here is how to code this you can go to this exercise and ramp I will patch it for sure but the hybrid thing is now what we want to go through we started quarter past okay so you have to talk quite quite fast so the main thing is what it will end up so if you have this app basically it will give you the chance to extract from the uh, swing stuff basic stuff for example all the services you have extract from the swing thing and wrap it in in services that you can consume via rest and so on how to distribute and scale it we'll see with infrastructure but how this is done for for the client developer it's good if you have for example then this shared libraries mostly this shared apis you should divide in two parts and a core thing that's ui independent and the ui basing and you will see that some of this stuff like internationalization and all this stuff you can use in swing and in a vadin app it's the same way you have this translation service and you're just using the same implementation don't reinvent it most people start reinventing all this basic stuff but you can just share these libraries you have one that's ui depend and you have one that is called java depend this is a good thing make a jar out of it make a version out of it extract it off, uh, out of the active code base so that you're not maintaining it and just forget it make a dependency out of it it's the first thing so minimize your core project in the beginning the next thing is you're talking about client server stuff so it's a back-end service you could start with this to have the feeling how to wrap this inside docker sometimes even if they're going to swing they have mostly this windows environment and using inside swing native libraries you have to make sure that nothing is left so that you can push all this stuff to different operating systems to make sure that everything is running not only on your machine what a wonder you can start to have your first experience with docker so not the full virtualization go to docker why it's just easy and fast and it's the first step to go for example i have here this is backend service you will see here exactly what's going on so we extract the api and the service itself and then you have this plane here i just using javelin and i'm just going here rest endpoints with pass and params and all this stuff now you have this you can debug and uh, deploy this locally on your machine but how to make sure that it's running inside your docker environment in the same way the easy thing is at some point you have to create a fed jar that everything is wrapped together and then you start writing this docker file it's not fancy it's just i have something with jdk installed i'm setting some paths um, this is completely useless only to give you a feedback okay jdk is running and then you're copying your jar your fed jar inside and you will start it that's it why you should do it you can do it because you can ramp up this one locally you can make a clean install or clean package on your machine and with this tiny script you can just test if this is running inside docker this fed jar is completely independent so on your local machine you just say okay ramp it up start it and then you're testing it you can ramp it up inside JUnit, for example, using test containers. Perfect. Or you're just using it uh, for your own development stuff. You're ramping it up in Docker and then you're creating your UI stuff and working against it. If you have done all this, you can just test if your image that you're providing is successfully running. So start it with the latest image. If you have this one, you can say everything is prepared now to go to this Dockerized stack and you can try the first way how to build and how to push and how to version it so this you can do on your local development environment you can ramp up everything on your local um, desktop but it's the first step to go to kubernetes or to other um, places where you can consume this docker images so this is what the developer can do locally 
if you're extracting the basic functionality there, you can have the first experience. So you start learning this stuff, how to deal with Docker, what are the pros and cons, what's going on with the JD, uh, JDK and all this stuff. So this must be done step by step. The same way how to test this stuff. For example, here is an example how to test. If you're going to the core swing stack, you can use this swing testing libraries for UI testing. It's really ramping up an app and doing all this stuff. If you want to do this in Docker, you have to use a Docker image with a virtual X11 um, stack. But the same stuff you can do in to test your Vardin app. And it means that you have here something like with JUnit 5, declare the lifecycle you want to have, create a page object you want to use, and then write your test. Go to this URL, setting username, password, and clicking the button. This is what a Java developer can do with this page object. And the lifecycle is Docker-based or locally here in this environment. So JUnit 5 starting up the backend service, server container, web driver stuff, and so on. So this is prepared, so you can play around with this and can test how you could start increasing test coverage against the Swing app and the web app. Because the UI is more or less the same, you can use the same test description and run it against both. You have a little bit different lifecycle. OK, this is so far um, from this here. Uh, just try it. Um, from, from the repository. And the main thing is the Swing app, the Bardeen app, and the hybrid app, everything we had here. And the next thing is just, yeah, use the right tool for your environment. So sometimes I see that people start um, playing around with um, huge stacks locally in the beginning, and then they have no control about what's going on. So please try to be small in the beginning, try to learn your technologies, you're using your tooling and all this stuff, go first to Docker and then go to bigger uh, infrastructure. The step to the infrastructure is not so bad if you have done the steps before, because then you know all the basic things. So in total, what I would say is, if you have split up all this stuff, we have different uh, modules, we extracted this stuff, we cleaned this stuff, we have the same coding language, Java, for example, everything's Dockerized, we are just ready to put it to the production um, infrastructure. The infrastructure will help you to deal with some economic parts. For example, don't buy a big server, buy only stuff if you need it at the same time or for the time you need it and so on. Well, this is more or less our infrastructures managed. And yeah, hopefully I'm right in time. I completely lost the time. Do you hear me? Yeah. Thanks. Cool. So after we realized we want to do the switch and actually move to the cloud, to the future, um, we need to understand how we're building the architecture, uh, what we're dealing with, and how we're doing the migration. And it can be even when we break up a monolith into microservices. Um, so in this part, we're not going to cover compliance. We're not going to cover container secure access, not namespaces. We're not going to talk about Kubernetes namespaces not CICD, not health management, and not lock collection. But if you are working with Kubernetes, this is all the stuff you should consider when you're putting together the architecture. And if you're interested in that, um, I wrote a report for DZone that's going to be published next month. Uh, so you can follow me, and I'll put a link out so you can see how you can build the whole architecture with all this, these things in mind.
cool. So when we actually want to do a migration or when we want to change our infrastructure, we need to do it gradually. And we need to do it in a flexible way. We should take one part at a time and, and deploy it and migrate it and see how everything works together to make sure we're always serving our clients. Because at the end of the day, if we're not a startup that's running from scratch, we have clients, and they're paying clients, and we need to make sure we're available for them. So one of the things we should consider, since we already have clients, and assuming we have a lot of them, is using distributed systems. Because it's not enough to have only one web server. We need to be able to provide to a lot of different clients what we used to give back when we had a desktop client. Now we need to provide through the cloud. So. When talking about distributed systems, there's a lot of things we should consider we're putting together the architecture. So we need to make sure it's available. We need to make sure we have some load balancing. We need to make sure we have enough servers that can serve our clients. We need to have scalability in mind. So if we're picking a database, or if we're picking some features or some component we want to work with, we need to make sure that it's scalable. Because we're going to pick something that it's not scalable, or it's not scalable enough to our cost, how much we can pay. And some features are scalable, and some databases are scalable, but the, their scalable part is very expensive. So we need to think about it. We need to put it in mind to understand what we want to do. We need to think about reliability. At the end of the day, it should be the client shouldn't feel what's going on underneath, and it should have the same output. The data that we give them, the information that we give them, the service that we give them should be reliable. It should have the same out output. And at the end, it's transparency. We need everything to be transparent. The user shouldn't feel that there is a whole system behind hundreds, hundreds of servers, hundreds, hundreds of VMs. They don't need that. They don't need to understand it. Everything should be transparent from that point of view. And then when we break our architectures, there's a lot of workloads that we can think about it. There's a permanent workload, something that's always running, something that's always there. And then we can use the regular hardware that we have, or some VMs, or some features that we can provision and do our own stuff. But then sometimes we have the burst workloads. And the burst workloads can be some reporting system that runs once a week, twice a week, something like that. We know we have a big peak. We need a lot of VM. We need a lot of power. And then we're shutting it off meaning we don't necessarily have to hold all those VMs or all this hardware that's going to be just idle what we're paying for. So for this kind of stuff, we have Azure Container Instances. And is someone here you work with Azure Container Instances? Heard about it? Looked at it? Cool. Um, so Azure Container Instances is basically instances as a service. Uh, it manage everything behind the scenes. We give them the amount of uh, uh, the, the type of group that you want. It put together the VMs. It's really good for burst workloads. It's not cost affecting for, um, for regular workload. So put that in mind when you're putting together the architecture. Um, it's really useful. It's really easy. It's very easy to use. The thing is that you should think how you put it together with the rest of the systems. Since the rest of the system, you have burst workloads, like report system, perhaps. It runs once a week. And then you have the normal workload, where users are logging in, doing their stuff, checking out, all these kind of things. Um, for that, we also put together an MS Learn, so you can go online and do the training yourself for free. So this is all nice. We have a lot of VMs, maybe our own hardware, maybe uh, we're working with the cloud but we need to manage. We need to put everything together. So we have maybe containers, because we're working with Docker, and Docker is super easy. And we have the VMs, and we need to think about network, and we need to think about security, and we need to think about deployment. And for all this kind of stuff, we have Kubernetes, which is an open source orchestrator manager that takes care of all the stuff for us. So is someone here already worked with Kubernetes? Uh, AKA, Azure Kubernetes Service, the managed Kubernetes. Is someone here looking into trying Kubernetes? Cool. Um, so for that, we have Kubernetes. Uh, around the world, a lot of people already use it, mostly in startups. Now in enterprise, I can share with you that I'm working with some of the engineering team in, uh, in Israel, the R&D, and they integrated Kubernetes there as well, and it's it's going to go wild in the R&D in Israel 
probably all the teams going to use uh, Kubernetes uh, underneath for their infrastructure. Um, the thing is that you should bear in mind that's the security and the logs parts and all this kind of stuff, which is very important because Kubernetes doesn't give it specifically out of the box. So why Kubernetes? It can run anywhere. It's great because you can move from cloud to cloud if you want, and you can move from on-premise or your private data center to the cloud. Uh, it's distributed and scalable. Basically, it does all the hard work for you. You give it the VMs. It manages everything around it for you, and we're going to look at it. And it's a container orchestration and container schedule. When we say container schedule, it means it does the deployment of the container itself. It takes a Docker image, put it where it needs, according to some specifications you give it. So you need to give it some tolerance. You need to give it some description. But then it knows how to find the right node where your code should be running at, which is a great thing. And also, if it fails, it makes sure to revive it, to check what's going on, and try to lift it back up. So what do you need to start with it? You need a Docker file. At the end, it's a orchestrator. So you need to, to have the, uh, uh, the Docker file for it. You need some container registry, because it pulls the, con uh, the images from some container registry. Is someone here working with container registry at all? Images, Docker, cool. Um, so we need some container registry. And I'm going to add a little bit into it, because there's also a security element there. And at the end, after the Docker file or image was created and some build tool that we have, it puts, we put it into that container registry, just like Swen Schwa before that. And then Kubernetes, with secrets that we give it, can access the container registry, pull the image, and put it over the Kubernetes infrastructure. So as I mentioned, uh, for container registry, on Azure, we have also a specific product for it. It's ACR, Azure Container Registry, really hard to forget. Um, basically, uh, it's a private container registry uh, where you can hold your images there. And why is it important to have a private container registry? You can use tool like vulnerability scanning. You can be in charge of all the images that your team is creating. And it's really, it's really important to think about it. Because at the end, if we're just pulling images from the internet, we not necessarily know what we're getting. We don't necessarily know what's going on in the specific version. We need to be able to run some vulnerability scanning on top of that image to be able to serve our clients in the best way, especially if we're working uh, with privacy data and things like that. We should always have that in mind, that this is, um, can be, if you're not doing it, it can be a huge backdoor for bad code to get into your system. And for that, we also have documentation, of course. And then we want to combine everything together. So we have the container instances that we know is good for burst workload. And we have the container registry that holds our images after we dockerize everything. And we have Kubernetes. We have AKS. It's the managed Kubernetes. But we want to put everything together. At the end of the, at the, end of the day, on Kubernetes, we have the nodes, we have the VMs, but we want to put all those pieces together because ACI is totally serverless, and then we have Kubernetes who is not serverless, uh, and ACR. And for that, we have Virtual Node. And Virtual Node is an open source project that Microsoft supports and created. Basically, it helps us connect different SaaS, software as a service component, back into Kubernetes infrastructure. And the nice thing about it, it's open source. You can use it anywhere. And you can connect different components from different cloud, from different regions. So if you want to have one Kubernetes cluster and have control of a service that runs on a different region, you can also use that for it. And how does it look like behind the scenes? So this is a managed Kubernetes. Usually on Kubernetes, we have a master node and the worker nodes. And when it's managed, we don't have access to the master node. So the master node is hidden from us, and we're seeing only the workers. And this is our nodes. And on each node, we had something installed that called Kublet. And the Kublet are managing the node. They are in sync with the master nodes, who runs the different pod configuration. And they update the master node if something is failing, if something is not working well. 
So this is an actual VM, where on the VM, we have the node installation with the kubelet and everything there. And then we create a virtual node. And the virtual node, we can call it either virtual node or virtual kubelet. Virtual kubelet is used for a Windows machine. Virtual node is used for Linux machine. So we can create the virtual kubelet or the virtual node and then connect it to anything that we want, any SAS that we want. And we created a lot of connectors and a lot of different cloud providers created a lot of connectors. So if you need to connect stuff from different clouds, it's also there, not only Azure. And from there, you can take it and use it. So this is actually our way to connect it back to ACI, to the container instance that we spoke about, so we can actually combine the different workload after we are uh, doing it. So how is it going to look together? So we said the, the virtual kubelet is actually our connector to any serverless product we want to use. So here in this picture, we have a Kubernetes cluster. We have some nodes and then the virtual kubelet, the same as we had before. And underneath that, we had the ACI product that we can run. And it can has a Linux container or a Windows container and, and, or anything we want to do with it, our choice but we connect it with it, meaning we can do deployment through Kubernetes who manages everything for us underneath if something fails, if something's not working well, and actually leverage those strengths of Kubernetes and connect it with something like ACI. So ramping everything together, when we do the architecture, when we think about it, we can also bear that component in mind and say, okay, Maybe for my report system, I should look at that. So how do we define everything together? So in order to define a pod, which pod gives us the definition of how our deployment is going to run on top of the nodes, on top of Kubernetes, we can have some YAML file or JSON file. And in this file, we give it the type. So we can have deployment, we can have server, we can have a lot of different the service, we can have a lot of different types that we give it, and then we give it spec. On the spec, we need to say, how do you pick your node? You can have virtual node, you can have an actual real node running on a VM. How do you pick your node? How do you decide what you're gonna do? So under the node selector, under the spec, we can say, okay, this is the Kubernetes I.O. that I want. In the example, we have Linux. Underneath that, we say, OK, we have a type. You're going to run on a node of type virtual kubelet. So it knows to search for the virtual kubelet. And then we give it the containers. Where are you pulling the containers from? What is your containers registry? Give me the URL. That's right here under the image saying, this is where I'm going to pull my container from. Of course, coming together with that, we need the secrets. We have to give it the secrets for the container registry. As we just said, it's private. We're running uh, some security vulnerability scanning on it. So we need to give it the specific secret. And then we need to give it some toleration. What should you look for in the keys? What should you look for in the spec that we're running? So we're giving it Azure, because we're going to connect it to, to Azure, uh, virtual Kubelet IO, and all this kind of stuff. So this is basically how the um, YAML file looks like. And let's look a little bit about how it looks on the portal. OK, so let's start a little with the command line. So for Kubernetes, we have the CLI kubectl, and we can actually get the information back of the pods, the nodes, the deployments, everything we want to see. So let's start with get nodes, minus o, wide, because I want to see all the information, and hopefully the network is good. Yes, network is, is OK. So what we can see here, it's going to be easier for us to see. So what we can see here that I created my Kubernetes cluster with three different nodes, actual VM, and then another virtual node. How do I know it? I can see that it gives it a node pool, and I can see that it gives us a specific ID. And then I can see here that I created a virtual node 
to connect to ACI. I gave it a specific connector when I created it on a Linux machine. So that's great. I know I have the right node for the spec that we saw earlier, so we can select it. But I want to see how do I, where it actually is. So I can do kubectl get pods minus o wide, and the wide give me the information about the node, about the specific IP that it's run at, the age, how long it's running, did it do any restarts, meaning it failed, something happened, Kubernetes took care of it, and if it's in status running or stopped or ready, all this kind of stuff. So here you can see I have three different pods. The backend servers is the VADIN backend servers that we saw before. And it's actually running on a node of type virtual node, like you saw earlier. And for that, I can actually deploy more and more pods into the different nodes that I have with the right node selector. So in the node selector, I can say, I want to use the virtual kubelet, or I don't want to use the virtual kubelet. And then it's going to select the right node for the specific pod to run it. And like I said before, we can define services, and we can define deployment. So here you can also say kubectl get deployment. It's very uh, intuitive, so it's very easy and fun to use. And also, we can do services. So I'm actually getting back all the services. And I, I didn't show it, but I also defined some load balancer. And this is where the distributed systems kicks in, because I need a load balancer to actually be able to provide to all my clients. So this is the load balancer I, I created, and you can see it here, and you can also access it through the external IP, as a real client would do. Cool. So to ramp it all up, there's a lot, a lot of products on the cloud. There's a lot of way to create your distributed systems on the cloud. The thing is, you need to understand what is the workload you have. You have work, uh, burst workloads. You have uh, permanent workloads. What's the size? What the VMs? What's the memory? And what's the database? If you're using database, how scalable? Are you managing petabyte of data? Are you managing a few gigabyte of data? How much do you need to tolerate? And for that, we have a lot of different products. We have the web app services. The, the managed Kubernetes, we have the ACI, we have the service fabric, a lot of things. But you need to understand how you're tying everything together. And this is what Virtual Kubelet gives you. It says you don't have to pick one. You can pick Kubernetes. And then with the Virtual Kubelet, you can connect to different SaaS uh, options that you have. So if it was interesting for you, if you want to learn more, we always have a lot of documents for you that we picked up. Some of them are our learning path that you can do for free and also uh, speaks about security. And next month, I'm going to publish a DZone article about Kubernetes in the enterprise where we focus on security size of stuff, containers and things. How do you do the log management? Because the log management and the history server is super critical if you're using Kubernetes. And of course, be happy if uh, We'll e log in and try it out. Thank you. <laughs> Questions? My question was where's the microphone? And here it is. Any questions for the speakers? Are you hungry? <laughs> I mean, this, uh, I actually failed to mention in the beginning of this uh, little conference that this uh, certainly is not beginner level presentations. And we've had three heavy hitters uh, before lunch. And um, I guess maybe if there are no questions, we'll spill over to lunch and we have some minutes to spare. Oh, um, but do we have any If more? you're looking to start with AKS or all this kind of services, 
there's all this information there. And of course, if you have more questions, uh, my direct messages on Twitter are always open. So feel free to ping me. I'll send you the right documentation. And you can get started and learn about that, because it's definitely we're seeing that the industry is going to, towards Kubernetes, so investing a lot of it into it.